Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's great to be in another church. I, I really I love getting around different churches and, and visiting different places. Um, my little place at Sunnybank is uh, in the heart of what we would call now the, the, a very predominant Asian community. So over 60% of the community is from Asia, and uh, so we're a little like you, a little suburban church on a suburban block and, uh, and just trying to make a real go of it. Uh, we, we actually said to ourselves a little while ago that we're going to be an English-speaking church that's multicultural and multi-generational. So for that to happen, we've had to bring in a Taiwanese church on a Saturday night to, to, to do that. We've brought in a Korean-speaking and a Spanish-speaking church early on Sunday afternoons, and we finished with a Mandarin-speaking church later in the day. So, so our building is consistently being used for the Kingdom of God, and, and, I, and I love it. 40,000 people a week, Gary said, that, that uh, we connect. We have over about 1,300, 1,400 people who come through our place Every, every Sunday, um, and we're probably only twice, the building's only twice the size of this, and we just utilise it as best we can in our little community. Even now, I just had a message from my, uh, my bloke who's doing my admin, and, and he said, oh, there's a lady here who wants to get her baby christened. Um, what do I tell her? Um, uh, tell her that I'm away, and I'll get her details, and I'll follow her through through the week. So again, these are just the opportunities that we have by being in the community. And the thing that I love the most about Churches of Christ is that we together serve the one King. And that, that's it, no matter where we are. Communion is the same. Our worship, it, it's different, but it's the same. And, and, and we do the same, and we are all priests. None of us are more important than anyone else, and we all humbly serve the one King. Uh, it's, it's great. Hey, thank you for the privilege of being uh, here today, and uh, my church says greetings to you. I'd like us to turn to Luke chapter 7 if you've got your Bibles, because one of the things that I, I really, uh, I, I get this sense that in our, in our world, there's a little word that gets lost in translation a fair bit, and it's this word called gratitude. We have a, a world that is, uh, complains a lot, um, that demands a lot, and, uh, and little things like, someone said the other day on Facebook, what's something that you, uh, you remember from when you were a child? And one of the things was manners. Um, and I think our world is certainly heading down that path. And, and you've got to remember that we as Christians are placed in this world to, to take the Holy Spirit into the world. Therefore, we are the preserving agents. And so when the church gets silent, the world gets worse. And so we're the ones that have to be on the front foot of doing a lot of things. So today, I want us to look at this little word called gratitude, and I want us to sort of unpack that a little bit. So uh, let's see how we go. So I want to open up at verse 36. Thanks. We'll go. So I'm just going to preach through as we go with this. So let's have a look at the first slide, and we'll go from there. So verse 36 says this. One of the Pharisees, Simon, asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home, and he sat down to eat. So here's this Pharisee, his name is Simon, we don't really know much more about him. He's hosting a dinner party and he invites the up-and-coming rabbi, the new teacher in town, Jesus, to be at his place. We don't know why. We, uh, we, some might say that he was interested in what Jesus would have to say. Well, that's probably not the, the answer because you look at the way he treats him as we go further in the story. You'll see that he was quite rude to Jesus, so he probably wasn't interested in that. He wasn't a follower. And I think he probably invited him to check him out. Like we've been checked out online at recent times. The church has certainly um, they had this great opportunity to, to be checked out as they go. And Jesus was the same. He probably accepted this invitation because it was an opportunity to, just again, to show who he really was. It might have been that it was a bit of a coup to have this new rabbi at his house and, and was lifting Simon's prestige in town. We don't really know. The homes of the day, thanks, we'll go on. The homes of the day look something similar to this and, and what you would have had is up in the back corner there is where the, the guests would have sat and ate their dinner. Um, through the courtyard would have been people who were maybe invited but not to the meal. And then outside on the street you would see a crowd, crowds gathering. Why do we know this is the case? Do you remember the story of the, uh, the three men who brought their friend to Jesus and they couldn't get into the house? What they meant was they couldn't get past the gate to get into the house. So they were on the outside. So what did they do? They climbed up onto the roof and poked a big hole in the roof to get through and, and drop their friend at Jesus' feet. 
And so the whole idea of this house was so that they get the cool of the day and it was all built around a central courtyard where people could mingle. Guests would sometimes eat outside, they'd sometimes eat on the roof, they would sometimes do that. But uh, the customers of the day was that they'd have their dinner and they would open the front doors so that people who weren't invited could look in. All right? If you weren't invited and you heard something important, you would gather on the street outside just in case you got a little snippet. So here's this woman probably on the outside. Let's have a look at the next verse. It says this, When a certain immoral woman of the city heard that Jesus was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. She, kneeled, she knelt behind him at his feet weeping. Her tears fell on his feet and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. Can you see that the, the contrast here in our story goes something like this. We have a lady who is a sinner and we have Simon who is a religious person. Simon, he lived his life like all Pharisees seeking to, to adhere to God's law. He was respected in town. He was a man of God. People looked up to him and he stood tall in the city. And then on the other side, we have this lady who didn't obey God's law. She lived her life contrary to God's law. She wasn't well respected. And in fact, the only people that ever turned to her were those who would never admit it. She spent her life in the shadows and she didn't want to be known or noticed. And every day, she faced rejection. So I want to bring out a couple of things about this lady and I'll see whether we can, we can work it. So the first thing about this lady was is that she saw she had a need. So the difference between the lady and Simon was that she understood she needed mercy and forgiveness. She, she was one who, who wanted to, to go to Jesus and, and wanted to fall at his feet. She wanted to be made new. Where Simon, he, he didn't realise that he needed forgiveness. He didn't realise that he needed to come to him for God's mercy. In fact, Simon didn't need God at all, really. It makes you wonder, I suppose, who was the greatest sinner? Think about it. What's the biggest person, what's the biggest problem that someone could have? We have an alcoholic who is a drinking problem, who admits that he's an alcoholic and gets help. Or we have someone who just is a heavy drinker and won't admit they've got a problem. Or what about someone who, who might have the greatest physical risk? Someone who knows that they're sick, they go to the doctor, they start to get treatment for their illness. Or, or what about the one who just ignores it, like most of us blokes do, and says everything's going to be okay? See, the question really that we've got to ask here, who is it that has the greatest need? Is it the religious professional who thinks that he is self-sufficient? Or the blatant sinner who comes to God and falls on their knees and asks for forgiveness and a new life? The question I want to ask you right now is this. Where are you in life in that capacity? You see, we're all like that lady. We've all got a stained past. Yes, we're all like that lady. All of us. See, God sees that it's sin. He doesn't see the degrees of sin. It's us who classify sin. She was willing to receive God's grace and Simon thought he was just doing okay on his own. So where do you sit? The second thing about this lady is that she... Sorry, go back one. She believed in the promise of God. I wonder why she even came to this dinner. It's that's the very thing that intrigues me in this whole story. I believe she'd heard some of the things that Jesus had said. So what's some of the things that he said? Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavily burdened, and I'll give you rest. I wonder whether she'd heard, whoever comes to me, I will not drive away. And as she's heard those words, she believed. She believed what Jesus said. She believed who he was and she took those words on face value. <coughs> she knew that she could come to Jesus and be forgiven. This is what John Ortberg has to say. 
No one ever grows up thinking that they'll be a prostitute. Once this woman had been someone's little baby, the object of a mother's hope and dreams, maybe her husband had rejected her. And this was the only way that she could survive economically. Maybe her heart had become hardened and this was the simplest way that she could get the most money. One thing for certain, this woman knows what it means to be despised, unwelcomed. See, prostitutes in those days were usually slaves who had either been captured in war or abandoned as infants and raised as part of the sex life. She carried in her heart the enormous wounds of rejection. No decent person would ever speak to her or welcome her or acknowledge her. Doors would only open to her at night and in shame. So when this woman hears Jesus teach, the thought occurs to her that she, right there in her life, her sin, is loved by God. He thinks of her and he longs for her as if she was his only daughter. And she's valued. And it's not too late even for her. See, I think one of the hardest things in this, this journey for us in life is believing what Jesus says. When we start and we think about who we truly are inside, we, we look at our life and, and we're repulsed by our sin. We know who we are deep inside. And to hold this fact that Jesus loves us in spite of all those things is sometimes difficult for us to get our heads around. We say, I know I'm forgiven by God, but I just can't forgive myself. I want you to think of a pilot right now. So you're sitting in your aeroplane, you're sitting in the cockpit, and you're flying into clouds. As you're sitting in those clouds, you have this feeling like you're descending. And so you want to counteract the descending feeling. But then you look at your instruments and your instruments tell you that you're maintaining. What do you trust? A pilot needs to, needs to learn to trust his instruments, not his senses or his feelings. The, the, the instruments are objective, they're not subjective like we are. And this lady gets to this point where she knows she needs to come to Jesus and she knows that and so off she goes to him. And, and she says, I might be able to forgive myself, but I know that God forgives me. And then she learns to trust on his promises. So what did she then do? She acted in response. She acted. She washed Jesus' feet with her tears. And I want to tell you, that's either from regret or that's either in gratitude. But she falls at his feet. She dries her hair, his feet with her hair. And again, that's another cultural thing they wouldn't do. A Jewish woman wouldn't leave her home with her hair undone. It was, it was a sense of shame. She then broke this flask of, of, of oils and, and perfumes and put it on his feet. What she did was public and extravagant. She loved Jesus, she sought his forgiveness, and she wanted to demonstrate how she was feeling. And all around her would have been eyes piercing the back of her head. Because the crowd would have been disgusted in what she did. How could this woman even be here, let alone being at a rabbi's feet, a teacher's feet? They were embarrassed. It didn't make sense. But for her it did. This is what she was saying. Today I am making a stand. This decision for me to approach Jesus is going to cost me everything that I've ever known. It's going to cost me my career. People are going to look at me and they're going to know that this is the woman who did this to Jesus on these days. She was no longer hiding. She was no longer going to suffer from embarrassment and shame. She was making a stand. I am a child of the Most High God. And I want everyone to know it. Fresh starts. Isn't it beautiful? That's what Jesus gives us. Fresh starts. But here we have Simon over here. And knowing what's in Simon's heart, this is what Jesus says. Thanks. So let's move on. He told a story. 
He said, a man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 to another. We're talking here about a year's wage and about a month's wage, okay? So they're the two contrasts. Neither of them couldn't repay. So he kindly forgave them both, counselling their debts. Who do you suppose would love that person more? Who's going to be more grateful, Simon? Is it going to be you or is it going to be this lady? Who, Simon? Simon responded. He said, I suppose the one who has the largest debt counselled. That's right, said Jesus. And here is the crux of this whole story. He then turned to the woman and he said to Simon, you get the picture? He turned to the woman, but he's speaking to Simon. He says, look at this woman kneeling there. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the first time, from the time I first came in, she's not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she's anointed my feet with a rare perfume. You see, Simon had ignored all of the common courtesies. They were to kiss their guests with a, with a, a, a refreshing kiss. They were to wash the feet and they were to put fragrant oil on their heads. It was a sign of just respect, nothing more than that. Why? Why would he do that? I would simply say it was to put Jesus back in his place. Put Jesus back in his place. You are the invited guest here, but you know what I'm going to treat you? I'm going to greet everyone else in the room with a hi, and I'm going to ignore you. We ever had that feeling? And here's this lady who saw this disrespect happening. Maybe she didn't even intend to cause a scene, but she knew that Jesus deserved respect. But whatever prompted her actions... She showed it with gratitude and love. And let's have a look at what Jesus says to her in the next slide, thanks. I tell you, remember he's talking to Simon here. Her sins, have, and there are many of them, have been forgiven. So she has sown much love. But a person who is forgiven little only shows a little love. And then Jesus turns to her. And he says, your sins are forgiven. Meanwhile, the men at the table said amongst themselves, who is this man that goes around forgiving sins? So as Jesus said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. See, people who have um, been forgiven very little or had those chum uh, lives that we would call it, find it really difficult to show gratitude. How many of us, when we get our wages or we get our money from Centrelink or wherever we get our money, say, thank you for your kindness? Well, we don't, do we? We, we get our paychecks or whatever and we, we, we work for that, so therefore we're entitled to it. When we get an unexpected gift, sometimes we say thank you. But sometimes we feel like we're entitled to that gift. We see that in kids, don't we? We sit there with our kids, you know, kids that grow up in families where they've got everything, just expect that they continue to get more and more and more. A new car, new gadgets, and they're less and less grateful for what they get. And I think that's a real problem for us in Australia. We are a blessed nation. We have so much, and we take so much for granted. That showing gratitude is one thing that I reckon our, our Australian uh, community is missing. You talk to a kid who grows up in the school of hard knocks and you just watch their hearts and how grateful they are. My story goes that I came to Australia when I was two. My mum and dad were 10 pound ponds. We arrived here into a, which is now a detention centre in Maribyrnong, Victoria. It was known as a migrant hostel in those days. Not much has changed though, I'll give you the drum. My dad went and worked every day of his life. If he got on a bus, he got a job. If he didn't, then he, he didn't work. If he didn't work, you didn't get out of the migrant hostel. We rented a little what you would call a bungalow in someone's backyard, a one-bedroom bungalow in Melton, right on the outskirts of Melbourne, miles away from everywhere. My dad worked two or three jobs to try and make ends meet. 
I still remember mum working in an ironing sweatshop in the city, putting doilies onto paper, paper on bits of cardboard so that they can they can make a living. And for, for me to get things cost my parents hugely. And, and I'll never forget that lesson in life. I appreciate what things what people do for me. But on the other hand, I see people who expect. And I think here we have the story between Simon and this lady. It's interesting how this story ends though, isn't it? This woman leaves knowing that her sins are forgiven. We'll go to the next slide, thanks. Um, she leaves knowing that she's forgiven and she's accepted by God. Why? Because she believes. And meanwhile, the religious people in town, they were left struggling saying, who is this man? See how one person can see something so differently. The woman left blessed and the Pharisees left more distant from God. And, and that's a struggle I see in our life. Those that want to come near to God, he says, I will draw near to you. And they get the blessing, they get the forgiveness. But I'll tell you, those that turn away from God, their hearts get colder. And it's more and more difficult for them to see who God is. So I suppose I just want to leave with these couple of questions on here as to how we might bridge that gap. The first one is to repent of our pride. Too many people in our Western world, and especially even in churches and, and the people that we mix with, compare themselves to others. And they say, I'm somewhere on this scale of goodness. Am I the only one who thinks that, or am I right? We always weigh up someone. Oh, what's your job? Where do you live? You know, all those sort of things we ask because we're trying to see where we fit in the scale of, of importance. When we start to measure ourselves by God's standard, we see that pride is an offence. And we know that we are, we are people created in the image of God to, to love and serve God because He loves us. And, and we are undeserved, but we get it. And we should bow in, in humility before our God. The second one is to turn to Him for forgiveness. It's beautiful that the Lord offers forgiveness and mercy to everyone who reaches out. Everyone. He doesn't say you're a good person, therefore you're invited. He normally reaches out to those that are shunned by society. Why is the church full of middle class people? I'll tell you why. Because they're people who normally come in not middle class and very quickly get established. They get very established because all of a sudden the blessing of God comes their way. And they, and they can very simply see how God is working in their life. So have you reached out to Him for forgiveness? The third thing is develop an outlook of gratitude. I want to tell you it's not something you can turn off and on. It, is, it comes from here. Who you are. It's a lifestyle. And I think it's to start looking at ourselves as people who are truly blessed. We are blessed. We are children of God. The creator, the sustainer of all things. We are blessed people. So for that reason, start saying thank you to the people that are around you. The people who serve you. The waitress, I tell you, I don't walk out of a cafe without taking my cup and saucer back to the, the waitress tables and saying thank you. I, I always try to do little things like that in a way so that they actually say, oh, that bloke was different. And it may lead to, well, why? I reckon in all my life I've probably had one of them ask me, why are you different? Just one. And I would say thank you, Lord, for that opportunity. Hold the doors open for people. Buy a lunch for a friend. I, I don't know what it is. Let someone go in front of you at the supermarket when they, you see that they're, they're in a hurry or they're struggling or whatever. Um, just don't take things for granted and have this attitude. And once you start to do that, you, you'll get this taste for what life is really about. We are the servant of God. We are the light that He will shine out into the world. And it comes from our deep-seated attitudes of gratitude. And then the last thing, as this lady did, she expressed her gratitude, didn't she? I had a bloke in my church who, uh, who, who came to faith only about five years ago after receiving the best news that he's ever had in his life, which was cancer. Um, the doctors gave him such a short period to live that he turned to the church and he said, I need God's help. 
Um, Wayne now holds a full-time job, works again, he's, he's, he's over his cancer, and he says, God has given me a second chance. Can I tell you, people who have had second chances know how to say thank you. They know how to show their enthusiasm for life. Can I tell you, we are those people. We're on a death sentence. Don't think of us as any different to a, to a cancer patient. We were dying. We were dead. And we've been snatched from the death and given life. And, and, and as a result of that, our, our world should be so different. <coughs> Do you know when you sing a song? I love singing as loud as I can. No one around me loves hearing me sing. But, but I love singing loud. Because why? I'm singing for the one. Okay? I don't... You know what? Don't take this the wrong way, but I don't really care how much you have to put up with my singing. I'm just going to sing loud for the one. But this is this gusto of life that we've got to have. I love to give sacrificially to the Lord, supporting different ministries. And I, and I heard Michael and he joked afterwards when he said, you know, God loves this and a cheerful giver and all that stuff. He does. But you know what? Make a sacrifice this week to show how happy you are and how grateful you are to what the Lord is doing. Maybe it's because you're able to, or maybe it's because you can't do it that you should do it. What about giving some time? What about going and visiting one of those, you know, 1,900 people that live in our nursing homes? Well, what about going and serving somewhere else in our community? Just give up some of your time. What about looking for ways to share this message of hope with others around you? Thanksgiving. That's what God asked us to be. People who give thanks. I, I, I mean, see, too many Christians, too many people that are just full of their own importance. I really do. Oh, I mix with things like now in my role, the heads of churches. So I've got, you know, the Anglicans and the Unitings and the Lutherans, the Salvation Army, the Catholic. But we meet together. And you know what? What a humble men, a group of men and women. I was in Melbourne last week with the Australian Churches of Christ, you know, doing some things with them as a whole committee of what we can do. And there's a great humility amongst those. But then I come to churches and I say to people, oh, can you give me an hour of your time this week to do something such? And it seems like life is too busy or there's too full of their own importance to actually come and do it. I look around here and I see, what, 40 people sitting in a room here. If you all influence one people this week for Jesus... If you had one conversation with Je for Jesus, just did one thing for him this week, there would be 40 other people who would be blessed by you. And you do it not because you really want to, but because you're grateful for your position in Christ. You are this woman. And now you're a, ch a child of the Most High God. I just, I, I, I love this concept of this woman who then lived a changed life. But I'd like to know that the rest of the story, you know, I want to know, and so there isn't any more about her. Did she, did she become the greatest evangelist in town? Well, my answer is probably yes. Did she influence men and women for God rather than for evil from hearing? My answer is probably going to be yes. Why? Because Jesus told her to go at peace. Forget who you've been. Forget your past. Look forward to the future that God gives you. She lost her income. She lost her job. But the best thing she got is her reputation. And she got a new identity. And what does God say? I will meet your need. I will meet your need. God always meets us where we are. Let's pray. Father, we, let's all stand as we do that, will we? Father, as we stand here before you this morning, we are so grateful to be your children. Lord, and it's all because of your work. Everything that we are, everything that we can become is all because of you. You've loved us and you've shown us what that love looks like. And, and you then tell us to, to love you the same way. It's this sacrificial love. Because once we were your enemies and now we're your children.
once once we were distant from you and, and now we are close. Now we're servants of holiness. And we have your spirit living in our, inside us, your Holy Spirit that empowers us and guides us and directs us. And Lord, as we go into this week, all we ask is that as we take these bold steps for you, that you give us the strength, you give us the encouragement, and you give us the opportunities. And Lord, we just want to serve you because we love you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.